It's not to mean anybody's less smart. It's what we're smart in. Because I'm really impressed with uh, the speakers here and some of the people I'm hearing discussing things, uh, technology and such. And um, I, uh, I learn a lot from these things. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm not claiming to be like the number one hacker. I think someone else <laughs> tried that and let's not go there. <laughs> Actually, I think I checked my number for hacker. It's an irrational number. Moving along. Uh, okay, we're re uh, you're rolling? All right, recording. cool. All right, basically, um, working title, when domain names look like spaghetti or whatever. Now, this is an emerging issue. Uh, so if you haven't see seen some of the stuff I'm talking about, don't worry, you're not, uh, you haven't missed things. It's something that may be a little ahead of the curve in the United States. But you're likely to see it if you're dealing with anything uh, crossing the globe, uh, international stuff. Okay, introductions about me, about the presentation. Okay, one of the uh, big things I do is uh, open source intelligence. I do some of that at work, and also I do it as a, if you will, professional avocation and hobby. I'll dig into stuff, like something hits the tech press, the news, and I don't like just taking what they say. Like uh, there are things been about certain uh, hacker tools or uh, criminal hacking tools. Uh, uh, you know, say in Russia or such, and the press might say one thing. I try to find out a little bit more what's going on. Is this something that's being hyped or whatever? So. Uh, it's open source intelligence in the network world and the alphabet soup reference, if you notice uh, that poll has some interesting acronyms, uh, you know, TCP, IP, SNA, et cetera, et cetera. Because I dabble in languages. I love language. I grew up uh, with Latvian as my first language, then learned English, bit of French, German, Abyssal Yiddish, uh, Hebrew, working on Arabic and Russian. I'm not fluent in them. There's, uh, you know, a five-year-old kid from Lebanon or from uh, St. Petersburg will out-talk me any day of the week. I'm hoping to get really good at it. But for navigating my way around the network world, I can deal with it. The one, uh, one hazard is that um, a couple things happen. One, alphabet soup sometimes is just a meal. There's a classic Frank and Ernest cartoon showing the two characters in a CIA cafeteria, one staring intently at his bowl of soup, the other's going, Ernest, alphabets, it's alphabet soup, not a code to crack. But, uh, uh, but that's an occupational hazard. Uh, now, you haven't seen my keyboard. You're welcome to come and look at it afterwards. But this is a little snippet of my keyboard. I don't know how clearly you can see it. But it's equipped to do uh, Hebrew, Arabic, as well as Latin alphabet. And I can also do Cyrillic. I just don't have room to put extra characters on my keyboard. I call it the keyboard that's going to get me in trouble when I travel internationally. <laughs> One border or another is going to say, you have what on there? Uh, now, this presentation is the outgrowth of an article I wrote for Digital Forensics Investigator News back in uh, July. And that article actually was an outgrowth of my interest in languages, my interest in information security, and the networked world, because I, I see a lot of things going on across borders, you know, tr transcending borders, be it uh, good things, there's some great projects going on across the world, and so it's not all bad. In fact, there's a lot more good out there, but there's also some bad stuff. And um, there are some new developments were certain assumptions we've had all these years. Comfortable assumptions for us in the English-speaking world. You know, like, oh, everybody uses a standard QWERTY keyboard. Careful with that. United States, UK, you're okay with that. You start to get into certain parts of the world and it gets interesting, quite interesting. So the overview, I'm going to show some uh, information about internationalized domain names in the wild after explaining what that means. ASCII, compatible encoding, such as PONY code. And that's uh, very useful to know about. Going to look at some of the challenges of IDN 
for investigators and analysts. By the way, investigators can also be people just trying to check out something uh, coming in on spam or something I found in this uh, programming code. It looks like obfuscation, but I'm not sure. You might encounter it that way. Uh, I'm going to look at how some of the common net tools handle IDN or don't handle it. Finding who is info for domain names with IDNs. And at the end, the uh, issue I found the most discussion about IDNs in the security field has been something called homograph attacks using lookalike characters. Interesting enough, the biggest uh, volume of IDN discussion is marketing. When I go looking uh, online, I go to various forums. Most of the people are talking about how to use these uh, non-English, non-standard ASCII domain names for marketing overseas. Quickie terms, labels. So if I refer to a label, it's a part of a domain name or a URL, like the www in uh, www.doshocon.org is a label. The doshocon is another label. .org is a label. The .org is a top-level domain. Then we have country code top-level domains. For right now, most people have seen things like .uk, .ru, .de, you know, all, .us. You know, we're very comfortable with those. It's easy telling what country is associated with that domain name. It gets interesting and now. Interna IDN, internationalized domain name, is a means of making domain names that can have letters and, uh, that are not your usual standard ASCII. This is to uh, suit local languages and scripts. Unicode, I'm not going to go into detail, but uh, Unicode made a lot of things possible for working across languages. Uh, what was it? Late 80s, early 90s for uh, Hebrew studies, for studying the Hebrew scriptures. I had to get special software for the PC, had to use code pages. Uh, it got very crazy, and when you tried to work with multiple languages, you know, you want to do Hebrew, Arabic, Russian, and English. You had to juggle a lot of things. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Unicode came along and it gave a way for encoding characters, code points uh, for all kinds of uh, scripts. So uh, you, you have, um, you could, uh, most obvious, of course, were a a regular ASCII for Latin alphabet, extended ASCII for different characters, Cyrillic, Arabic, Greek, and so on. Um, ACE, ASCII compatible encoding, because not everything we use for connecting the networks, in fact, much of it doesn't understand Unicode. It's built in the days of ASCII. So ACE was a method to make encodings that could uh, be turned back into Unicode. You could take Unicode, turn it into a ACE, and come back to Unicode. Honeycode RFC 3492 describes the process. It's, I, I'm not even going to try to describe how it's done. It's rather arcane. There's probably some savant out there. You can throw them anything and they'll go, oh yeah, this is XN dash, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so these are the terms. Now, I'm going to take a little uh, simplifying step back. Phone books. I know they're disappearing. A few years from now, people are going to go, what's a phone book? I just use the computer. I use my mobile device. But phone books, those quaint uh, paper items. Imagine if you had a, a phone book that had the usual English, but the phone company decided to extend it more, make it more user-friendly for ethnic communities, for emigre communities. And uh, so Ivana uh, Petrov could have her uh, entry not only in English or Latin characters, but also in Cyrillic. Ahmed Yusuf could have it in Arabic, and so on. Someone could have it in Korean. The Chinese restaurant not only has an entry in the uh, Latin alphabet, but also to uh, help uh, Chinese people find, it, find that restaurant has it in Chinese, both simplified and traditional. Uh, Chinese gets very interesting for encodings. 
And some people might go, oh man, what's going on? I'm getting confused. Well, first of all, you have the phenomenon that a lot of people would have entries in uh, Latin as well as a foreign language, but the biggest item is they're still united by the phone number. The number does not change. Now coming to the networked world, on, the, on the, a machine level, Unicode is there. You know, it's the same Unicode. You know, when you're dealing with the binary, the hexadecimal, it's the same, all, the same things you've been dealing all along, as long as you know about Unicode. For internet uh, communications, you still got the IP, TCP IP, and all that. Your biggest uh, factor is going to be IPv6, but that's independent of all this going on. Domain names now come in many sizes and shapes. Uh, there was some uh, interesting place called uh, doshocon.org. Uh, right? That's, you, you know, very typical .com, Latin alphabet uh, domain. The register.co.uk is a good example of uh, something that has a country code, .uk. The next one, um, gindi.com. Gindi.com is an Israeli land, belongs to an Israeli land uh, real estate firm. There's a good example. It's a .com, Latin alphabet, but the first part, first label, is Beverit in Hebrew. The next one I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Uh, my Korean does not go uh, beyond food names and things like Anyon Kaseo. Uh, then you have uh, a site uh, about beer, uh, Pivna, uh, what is Pivnaya.erev uh, in Russia, totally in Cyrillic. Next one is an Arabic. Uh, 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 IDN, both the, uh, the top level domain and the um, site itself are in Arabic. Now if you got something like that, you found on a slip of paper, say, uh, dealing with some sort of thing going on, someone had it in a text, you might be going, what is this? This just looks like spaghetti. Like even, what's, what country is it associated? You might know it's Arabic. But if you don't read Arabic, where does where it go? How do, how do you even use it? I mean, the first freak out might be, how do I type it in? But we'll get to it. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or people will uh, contact me. Hey, John, John, hey, uh, what's going on with that? Astu.edu.cn is a Chinese. Uh, with, I forget which university, something like Shantong, or Shantong or University. I show that because the next one is in Chinese. That's a live domain name for that university. And the last one is an example of punny code. Uh, how many have uh, seen a punny code? The XN dash dash followed by what might look like, uh, I don't know, you might have trouble seeing it. Uh, but it's like XN, XN dash dash followed by letters like P, S, S, C, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, no one's seen them yet. Okay. You're maybe uh, either very early on, on this uh, or maybe fortunate in some ways. But that is a rendition. That's an ASCII compatible encoding of uh, that Chinese domain name. This is just to show that these things aren't just like somewhere in the, in the esoteric networking. This, uh, the lighting's poor, but the arrows are pointing to that Hebrew.com, that Gindi.com uh, uh, web, uh, web address on a billboard in Israel. Now, so it makes it a lot easier. Now, someone might wonder, well, if they can do the www and the .com, why have the Hebrew or whatever? Well, one of the reasons can be you might connect the name more easily to typing it out in Hebrew than thinking, how do I transliterate the name? Good example in Arabic. Oh, thank you. Is it a Jamal or Gamal? You know, or it's like there's certain letters and things. Transliteration can be very interesting. All right. Where things got really interesting, up to May of 2010, you could do the 
dot com dot org type of uh, IDNs where the other label was in a non ASCII form. What happened is in May 2010, after ICANN went through a whole process, first four countries came on board where they could register domains under top-level do country code domains in their own native script. United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the Russian Federation. Uh, one of the reasons for three Arabic countries was that there's a big interest in getting Arabic as the first uh, type of script covered because it covers a lot of countries in the world. Russia is also a big country, but it's pretty much one country. Uh, the uh, Russian Cyrillic does open the way for other countries that use Cyrillic. For example, Serbia is uh, coming on board. It's got its own Cyrillic top-level domain. Hey, John, I have a question. Sure. Uh, are the, the Arabic PLDs, are they written in reverse like languages? I noticed you have the name and the dot. Oh, yes. Good point. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, there's a slide later on that shows it. But um, this is one of the things that can really confound things. Because there's the beginning. That's uh, what is it? Amarat. Yeah, you know, you read it from here this way. Same thing for Saudi Arabia. What is it? Uh, Asaud. Uh, Russia it reads just like uh, you know regular Latin languages and Masa for Egypt. So this is part of the thing that can make it really fun, <laughs> and we'll get to it. And by the way, thank you for asking questions. I was concerned that at this late of, uh, hour in the day, I would hear the thunking of heads hitting <coughs> the chair, back of the chair in front of them. So good, good audience. And this summer has been a busy summer. Chinese uh, country code top level domains are on the fast track, and some of them are live. PRC, you know, got two. Oh, Chinese is an interesting one because Chinese and uh, characters can be encoded two ways on computers. Traditional, which is a little more fancy script and more modern, simplified. And I'm not an expert in Oriental, Far Eastern languages, so don't ask me uh, further on it. Uh, but, oh, one thing I will insert that I have heard that before IDNs came out that some students in Chinese universities along with sysadmins had set up private IDN type networks because you know you can do the DNS, you can set it up and route it. It was just not accessible to the world but among the university folks it worked very nicely. More Arabic IDNs came up. Another script that's a little more exotic for many people in the West. Thai, a Thai script for Thailand, Sri Lanka has its own writing. At, uh, and this is not you know, any disparagement. It was just at my first glance at that, uh, the writing for Sri Lanka, I thought, oh, this reminded me of Klingon writing, uh, being a Trek, Star Trek fan. Uh, you know, it's more a reflection of my geekdom than uh, on Sri Lanka. And I looked at INA's database uh, t this morning, and I counted with my bleary eyes 15 IDN uh, top-level country codes listed now. There are also test uh, 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 ones, too. And I'm taking a quick look, you know, showing some things from Google's uh, search. Uh, you can. Uh, you can do copy and paste, but you have to be careful how copy and paste works. With right to left languages like, like Hebrew and Arabic, uh, you, what happens is you start highlighting the cursor moving. And if there's a, another type of character, like a period, a you know, left to right uh, line, uh, type of char character system, the highlighting suddenly goes weird, you know, job. So you have to make sure you got everything. But uh, I did a few searches, and one of the things I was looking at is how many uh, hits I got by doing a site and then the top-level domain. For Egypt right now, it's about 7.5 thousand, 7,500 hits. Okay, you know, it's a start. China, 
uh, this is a People's Republic of China using uh, one, uh, what is that? I'm not sure if simplified or traditional. Got a 113,000 results. So, um, Russia is very interesting. That's been a fast grower. It, it actually was a little surprising because many Russians I had heard from were sort of skeptical, like we don't want to be backwatered from the rest of the world. You know, there was a worry that uh, that if uh, people were locked into a Russia, Russian only type of network that they'd be more isolated, but it's picked up, especially November 11th. Uh, the uh, Russian do, uh, domain registry allowed people, non-governmental entities, to register. And I think was it within three hours, 100,000 registrations were done. By November 18th, it was, as I recollect, half a million. You know, it's, uh, people have registered things for advertising. Uh, like the second hit is actually for one of the major uh, petroleum and gas, uh, natural gas, Gazprom is uh, a biggie there. Oops, that's not supposed to happen. That's known as hit the wrong key. So my life is flashing before me at least in the past <laughs> few minutes. Oh no! Yeah, this is without the after hours uh, belts of vodka and such. <laughs> you know, just if anyone's heading up 95, I will be uh, driving up the, uh, that road to go back to New Jersey, but I'll be sober. Okay, I was there. And funny code, okay. DNS, as I mentioned before, uses punny code. It translates those Unicode uh, characters if it encounters things that aren't your uh, traditional ASCII, to, for lack of a better term. It will translate them into punny code, which uh, you see that XN below. Uh, by the way, for knowing where the domain, domain's top le uh, level domain is, one of the advantages of punny code is that it reads just like a regular Western text from left to right. So you look at the first label, okay, there's a dot. You see an XN again, okay, that is the top level domain. So even if you don't know which one of these two labels here is top level domain, you've got this. Very important, one of the distinctive trait of Pony code is that XN and two dashes. Very important. And I emphasize this. This is one thing I wish I had uh, uh, thought of when I wrote my article back this summer. Is if you're doing any investigations or documenting anything involving IDN, uh, get a copy of the Pony code, and I'll tell you in a moment how to do it. But get the Pony code and keep that on hand because that is less likely to get mangled by our applications, by our tools and such. And let's see. Where is Good. Funny code. Uh, here we go. There are several tools out there. Uh, I had found one in Germany I liked, but this one, VeriSign, Domain Name Services, has a nice converter. And in fact, you see me having done a little bit of uh, work there. I plugged in some uh, Chinese uh, domain name and let it convert, and there's a punny code. They say you can do a who is query. It might not work. It's like if it's a IDN with a dot com, it might work. But some of these um, will not work. But at least this way, you got both. Or the other way around. You got a punny code and wondering what it is, plug it in and uh, you'll be able to use it. By the way, for web addresses and such, contact me when I, uh, uh, via contact info I'll give at the end. And um, I'll be glad to send you more info on it. Right there we go. Yeah, there's a picture of that um, same tool I was showing a moment ago. 
problems and challenges. First, realizing it's a domain name. It's like you might see it somewhere, like the Arabic or the uh, uh, like the um, Thai or others, and you're not sure is it a domain name or what. If you see an HTTP colon uh, slash slash, at least you know, okay, this is a URL. Or you might see an app sign, email addresses are coming. The big challenge is email clients. They're not ready to handle IDN quite yet. But that's going to come. So someday you may see an email from overseas that might be totally in Cyrillic except for the at sign and the period. Yeah. So, but uh, the other problem, as we saw with the Arabic ones, which end is the CCTLD? Which one's the country code? It's like there's a cartoon of, it's a little gross, someone picks up one of these little furry dogs that looks like a big ball of hair and is about to bring it to face and here's a barking from the other end. It's like, oops, didn't know which way it goes. You know, it can be gr uh, messy at times. Okay, and there's a little Arabic English pun. Uh, well, in a moment, uh, what country of registry? Same problem. You know, like you don't have the nice uh, dot ru, dot dot d, and so on. And sad because I couldn't find the sad key. It's a, again Arabic English pun with that letter, which is how do I enter that Unicode? You know, I, I have a computer set up, I can do several languages, but if I had Chinese before me, I can't do it. You know, that, that can be a big uh, hurdle in some cases. It may, uh, it's, um, if you have it in electronic form, <coughs> little friends known as copy and paste can be of help. But if you do that, make sure you have highlighted the whole thing especially with uh, certain languages because the highlighting can go very weird and that's where the next item comes in. Many tools don't work correctly with some IDNs and at the end I'll be covering homograph attacks. Uh, that's been a big concern uh, among the people. Although there's others say it might be hype, a bit of FUD. This is the fun with right to left URLs. All right, this is a live uh, a, a URL. Okay, there's a protocol. All right, it's a TTP protocol. All right, that's easy enough. Go from left to right. Oh, wait, what happens here? Oh, we start here and go this way. We go right to left. Oh, their uh, file structure on the server has naming in Latin. And you now go left to right. By the way, a little tr uh, hint. If you ever deal with um, trying to figure out some of the foreign websites, like how they're set up, because the language of technology is still dominated by English, sometimes look at the links, look at the URLs they point to. Like you might not, what's a, which, which link is for a forum? You can't figure it out. And then you look at the URL being displayed in the uh, uh, status bar. Oh, it's slash forum.asp or PHP. No problem. Downloads. So sometimes I find that happens, that you can figure out how these sites work. Oh, again. Yeah, in the dark. So you're getting a slight preview. Okay, come on. Computer is running slow. Good. All right. That looks like where we were. And not all our tools are ID and ready. I have a big question. Uh, yes. Or a question for the I, I, IDNs, I guess. Yes. Um, so you said that you know when you go from one of the Chinese or any of the languages, then you, the DNS translates that into that, uh, the punico. Exactly. And then I, I sort of like a mention of the punico, I don't know if it's, it's xn dot something dash dash xn and then like five or six yeah. characters. Yeah. Now is there a converter? Yes. The converter I show. that punico into something I can read? In oh. The this is a little, oh, okay. Yes and no. That uh, very sign 
page and similar tools I showed, you can put the punny code in and it will render it back into Unicode. But if the Unicode is something you can't read because you're not used to the language, the closest thing you can do is actually go to uh, Google Translate or any similar translator and put in at least get a name, what the idea of what the name means. But the Unicode is what they named that, uh, what the domain name is. Uh, only thing after that is you go, you can go to things like IP addresses un related to that unit, to that domain, to that IDN. But what they mean, this slide simply was a little foray into Windows, CMD, CLI, which I try to avoid when I'm dealing with this type of issue from uh, command line because Windows co uh, command line is not Unicode friendly this type of thing. It will render boxes or little question marks if I put a domain name that's in Cyrillic. You, can, you have to give it a change code page command. You have to change the code page to 65001 for it to handle Unicode. Oh, and then also you have to change the font because normally the default is raster font, set it to Lucidia console. So I'd rather work with this type of stuff in Linux or, um, or other uh, operating systems. And a uh, moment, I'll show you there. OK. I have some uh, already prepped into the history rather than trying to type it in the dark or copy and paste. But I copied and pasted from that earlier Russian uh, site's lookup from Google, the Gazprom.rf uh, uh, URL. Now here's I mean, domain name. I hit enter. This is a problem. He can't handle it. So, okay. Don't, don't bang my head with the microphone. That's, that act has already been done. <laughs> Quite well, I don't mind you. Okay. And I'm going to that VeriSign page. And I just put in that Gazprom, making sure it's, uh, the type is clicked, is uh, for native characters, hit convert. <coughs> All right, you did it. Now I take the results and make sure I get that whole thing, that XN, dash, dash, etc. And get a copy. And now we've got something. It works. And by the way, you can, this will also work with uh, other commands like ping, uh, dig. You, you can, uh, and even who is it will work. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment, but I just wanted to show you uh, something with these commands. No, there now you know how to complain about the Russian gas bill. And that's, uh, yeah, uh, interesting enough, uh, the one exception with uh, the Unicode I found lately, depending on the country, upon the registry, you can also do it with the Unicode. But most of the commands we use, dig, nslookup, ping, traceroute, they really work with the, uh, with the punny code. A few years from now, they might do their conversion on the fly. You know, they might just realize, oh, this is what you're trying to do. You know, handle it all and no problems. But our tools, it's, it's still young. This is a new thing for uh, many, of, uh, many of us. <clears throat> and uh, OK. I'm not going to go through all of them. I uh, just showed you the basic principle. You can uh, use a punny code with uh, the common tools. The who is can be tricky at times. It depends on things like who's handling the registry and uh, other factors. So if you do have trouble, a couple options. One of them is you use a punny code. You can use NSLOOKUP or other tools to get the IP address associated with it. And then 
you can you do a who is on that IP address, find out what block it's in, find out the contacts, etc. So if you do get uh, Russian spam, and I have that's one of the things I tend to get at work is Russian spam, you know, for some strange reason. You know, it's like, oh, give it to John, he'll figure out what it's about. <laughs> you know, it's good fun. You know, some of it. Nothing really, the, um, no porn spam, interesting enough. I guess, uh, I don't know what that says about uh, uh, my employer's profile. It's things like uh, selling goods, services, moving stuff. Another option is the INA, excuse me, IANA. It's got a database uh, that is very handy. And Oh, this is going to be a little difficult seeing because they love to use this light blue text. But this stores the root zone information. All right, going for IBM. All right. You have the uh, active IDN CCTLDs listed there. Um, no, it actually shows up better over there. But, um, you can see them, and these are, they are linked. So uh, let me, I'm going to pick on Russia. Nothing about Russia per se, it's just I know where it goes, so it's not going to... Okay. The surfaces, okay. And IANA keeps a delegation record. By the way, that uh, PONY code up there is the PONY code for the country code top level domain uh, name, the uh, label. That's the dot RF in the Cyrillic rendering PONY code. And you can find out, you know, coordination center, administrative contacts, technical contacts, but you go further, name servers. Subdomain info and a subdomain info can be very useful because it can give you URL for registration services and the who is server. By the way, if you use a registration server, uh, reg registration services, sometimes that's very handy because they have a who is. Very often, just like Aaron.net, RIP.net, and others, there's a who is uh, field on their page. And if you haven't dealt with uh, foreign language sites, don't, you know, it's, it's many people, some people I know, they first look at it and go, I can't do anything with it. It's in Russian or whatever. Take a moment and look carefully at some of these sites, especially for these uh, network administration sites. This is rather comforting. Who is? It's in Latin alphabet. It's a standard. Uh, technical terminology around the world, and you can plug in the uh, domain in, uh, domain name in there, and they'll give you the who is info. Some of the text around it will be in their native language, but again, most of the core information is going to be in Latin alphabet. That's uh, very helpful. Someday it might change, and uh, we're going to have a very interesting time. Very interesting time. I don't think uh, yet anyone's going to send me for Chinese classes uh, to cram. You know, if they send me to a good Chinese restaurant, I might cram then, but that's uh, <laughs> more uh, Mugu Gaipan. Yeah, we saw this already. And um, this is where I pulled up the Gazprom information. I just put a cobble together, a clip from their page, and the who is is on the on the right hand side. None? There it is in Latin alphabet, you know, domain names, you know, different information. No problem. Okay. And now we're coming into the last portion, the fun portion. This is like the optometrist. Is it better this way? Or better that way? Or better oh, oh that's better. No. Are these character sets are these sets of characters the same? 
And by looking at them, unless you're a real mm -hmm. font buff, and there are font buffs, you know, who play names that font. Oh, that's, uh, you know, that's uh, Ariel. No, that's Verdana. You know, can you top this font? The, um, actually, I can't even tell from here. Sometimes you can... Yeah, what did you say, the K? E-K-E. Good. Excellent. You got better uh, eyesight than I do, and that's wonderful. But those are subtle. But the average person, if they saw uh, these characters appearing in the middle of, uh, of a name of a site they considered trustworthy, uh, they wouldn't catch it. Uh, it's not until you... Remember what I said, that the underlying codes really are the things that uh, you can uh, uh, really find out the truth. The first set, ah, these are rather, uh, this is he hexadecimal, this is rather high, 0, 4, 10. This is not your normal characters, your ASCII character values. The one below, okay, the capital A is 0, 0, 4, 1. All right, that's more reasonable. So that's, well, that can be one of the ways uh, you can tell. If you were dealing with uh, examination, say, of uh, suspect f text files, and you brought them up in a hex viewer or other tools, what I would love to see develop is a good plug-in or some sort of function in browsers that could say, hey, you, pr you set your computer for English. You, do you know that there's a mixture of English and uh, a Cyrillic on here. Maybe, you know, would word it in something more user understandable, but it would warn you when there's a mixture, because this is very easy to do on the computer level. The way Firefox and some others chose to do it is, oh, it's got Unicode in the uh, URL, it got Unicode in the domain, use punny code. So people might look up, oh, I thought that was PayPal. How come I'm getting all this XM and bleep bleep light? You know, and I'll get to that in a minute. Yes, Mark? Yeah, yeah, right oh, 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 oh yes, thank you. Have you noticed some applications that show the font differently? Like, I, a while back I was trying to hide stuff in my Twitter post by using uh, Unicode characters, and I yeah. noticed if I put it in Firefox, it came out looking pretty good. Hard to tell that it wasn't. If I threw it into Internet Explorer, or at least if I viewed the tweet, tweets in Internet Explorer, it was all jacked up. Have you noticed some applications that I notice they vary. I'm not sure if that's done as a security feedback or is it simply variable handling of uh, Unicode and mixed character sets. That's a good question. I'll have to look at it. I don't have a... The only one I really was aware of is that uh, forced punny code in the, uh, in the address bar for navigation. But in a moment, uh, I'll get to why that might not work as well. Oh, by the way, I admire these guys uh, for their cleverness. That URL, I mean that domain name, is all Latin, but they did a visual pun. The uh, first label is Hakka in Russian. A, uh, it's, it's simply a bar, uh, it's a transliteration of the English word hacker. There's another word for hacker when it's referring to someone cracks into systems. No, what is it, Vislum or something like that. Uh, but uh, this magazine, it's a little bit like 2600. It's like an info security and hacking news magazine. I thought, cool, you know, uh, they hacked the language and in a good sense. Homograph attack concerns. Various people have raised it. One of them is Eric jo Johansson, who raised it back, oh, five years ago at a ShmooCon. He had uh, done a presentation. He showed how he registered a PayPal lookalike, and uh, you know how people could be spoofed out. Currently, he has another spoof uh, homograph registration. If um, you look up his paper, it's a, in, in the end of my DFI article. I have the link to his paper and his site. You'll find his own type. You'll find more info. But a lot of people I knew uh, know on. Uh, various cyber investigator lists, when they were hearing about the homograph attacks on IDNs, there was an interesting split between, among Americans and European participants on this list. Some of the Americans go, oh man, 
people could do all kinds of horrible things. This is going to be horrible. And the Europeans tend to be, eh, maybe having umlauts and all the accents and all that, you get, you're not as, you don't sweat this as much. You had to deal with different languages. But there was such a big worry that uh, substitution of lookalike characters would become common and how well the registrars would work to prevent uh, obvious fraud. There was a lot of worry. But uh, here's the interesting thing. The Anti-Fishing Working Group, uh, Global Fishing Survey, first half of 20, 2010, noted that the last true homograph attack they saw was in 2009, and that was a Hotmail.net lookalike. But that's the only one. Their theory? Two reasons. The fishers did not find it economically worth their while to go for, you know, registering IDNs, going out of their way, when what they were using already was doing quite a fine job. You know, it's like, why change the bait when you're catching enough fish and you're fishing? And the other thing, how many people look up at the bar, you know, to see, uh, you know, things like the Firefox warning you. It's like, people could, you could have uh, qzyh.net, People, oh, I'll click on it anyway. It's giving me the video I want or a download I want, the codex, whatever. And that brings us to questions. If any? Okay, I see one question uh, there. Is the public code uh, taken directly from the Unicode itself or is it from some type of database that it's pulling the public code from? It's derived. There's an algorithm. And the RFC that uh, I mentioned briefly, if you look at it, it describes the algorithm. It's not one I can do in my head. That's why I made that comment about a savant, but there's a whole algorithm. Uh, it's, I can't compare it to hashing because it's not one way. It's a two-way function, but it works very nicely. Yes? When did you say the Russian government answer came out? Well, okay, the government came on, oh, sorry. When did that become available? Oh, uh, the government, uh, uh, the Russian government, the Russian Federation, started issuing RF, the uh, Cyrillic top-level domain uh, registrations for its government sites back uh, around May. But on November 11th, they opened it up for non-governmental entities, and that's when there was a big rush. Yeah, my, my, the reason why I asked is that who is page you got shown, I said that the site was created in 2009. Okay. Yeah, I think it's probably just the, oh, I can see another reason. And I thank you for mentioning it, because when you start comparing the who is for the, uh, info and the IP address, in, IP address, you begin to find that the registration, the IDN, so often overlaps its history with the Latin domain registration, the dot .ru. So this is where it gets a little tricky, because uh, if you do a uh, an NS lookup, say, on uh, using the PONY code, like I did, uh, did uh, elsewhere for that Chinese university, I get an IP address. I plug it, uh, uh, do an NS lookup on the IP address, and I get the Latin version of the domain name. So these often are interrelated. Now, a lot of the IDNs currently are being registered where I'm seeing you have multiple domain names pointing to the same IP address. You, you use either version and you end up at the same place. They could do something on the server which could detect how you came in, what links you used, and figure, okay, you want it this way or that way. But there's a lot of overlap. But eventually we might see some places where someone wants to re register a domain name, wants to set up a website, they'll just go for their local script. If their customers, if their audience is local and used to using keyboards of their type. The one thing that might slow that down are mobile devices because mobile phones, many of them aren't really built to handle Arabic or Cyrillic. There's a whole issue with what are called chat alphabets. Like there's an Arabic, uh, there is Arabic chat alphabet. It's like transliterating your language. There's Russian versions of that, but that's a topic for another time. Any other questions? Oh, okay, way back there. You had made a comment, this is more of just a comment. You had made a comment that, uh, that in China they had been using some uh, Chinese uh, domain names uh, internally. I just wanted to, say, to confirm that I had seen that as well. Um, and you could actually, if you had located some of those DNS servers, you could actually query 
Mm -hmm. We were in the DNS servers with the, with the Chinese characters. You know, they've been doing this for several years internally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most of it just the dot, the dot PRC or the. Uh, right, uh, or the dot CN. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, well, they had, uh, for example, uh, as a regular idea in Google. Uh, uh, before it really ran into trouble <laughs> over there, some issues, little rev, little lover spat, or I, oh, no one from Google here. Eh? I hope not. But you know, so if my Gmail gets uh, a little readjusted, I'll know what. Uh, moving along, looks like. Uh, oh yes, Arcus. Oh there. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Are you sick? Do you know uh, any attacks using, uh, I mean, not, not homographic attacks, not the ones that look like the same, but do uh, you know any malware or anything using the Russian uh, or Cyrillic or any other language? Have you ever heard that before? Not yet, uh, although I could see it as another layer of obfuscation for people examining malware, especially if it's, it's likely that the, the people examining it will not really know Russian or they'll have to find someone. Uh, do I have anybody to see that there? Is there anybody to see that for? Uh, Cyrillic or Chinese or, or traditional? Nobody? Have you all seen malware like that? Yes or no? No. See malware how? See malware using like different uh, character sets. No. Different, different character, character sets. For, for the domains? Uh, no, I thought that when, I thought when Eric made that uh, statement in 2005 that uh, they did something to to hinder you from using uh, different character sets as an attacking hub. Like the next year, I think it was in 2006. Well, I'm just thinking that uh, as long as something can do it in its lookup, it can actually dial up. <coughs> it looks like that it wouldn't be an issue for programs to, to use it. Uh, yeah, well, uh, that's an interesting question, and I would uh, want to see what happens. Uh, one of the things I will mention, Unicode itself has been used to obfuscate uh, in the past, and you know now it's better known. You know, oh, they're trying to do this uh, to shape off uh, various tools. But uh, there are a lot of creative people in the world, and another thing which could happen is the implementation of the various network tools, the OSs, applications might have their own little glitches, like, it shouldn't do that. Oh, yes it can. You know, it, it's, uh, yes? I guess to tag off of what Marcus just said, wouldn't there be a problem on a Windows system trying to use another language, or by default, will it, can you use Cyrillic on a machine that's already programmed for an English layout keyboard mm -hmm. and, you know, the English language? Yeah, I do it uh, all the time. I mean, I can type in my menus on my English windows is still English. But um, if I want to type in text, I can, well actually, I'm not going to switch to uh, Windows because uh, it's... Uh, but you would, don't have to make any special changes like on the fly in order to use this, in order to change your keyboard over to Cyrillic to input a Cyrillic character. It depends on how much you want to do. Yeah, so the easiest way... The effective method anyway. Yeah, the easiest way if you just got a short run and you're sort of familiar with the language, just use a character map. Like I'm bringing up, uh, this is a, a Linux character map, but Windows has one under Accessory System Tools. Uh, so uh, here, here is Cyrillic. So you just double click and build your letters. You don't want to write uh, your uh, doctoral thesis in Russian <laughs> using this. If you do, you're a very patient person. Yeah, There's other attitudes. The language packs installed for some of that to work. Yes. Uh, the language packs, you can't use some of the, um, the character sets. Yeah, that's another issue. Uh, one of the things I can show, uh, just a picture, because I've done this. Uh, let's see, let me bring this. Right. Snaps. I, uh, I have a Windows Ultimate uh, at home, and uh, I can switch languages, download the language packs. So, um, what if you don't have a language pack, you can create or send some characters through Windows? You can, uh, it will still handle it. As long as it handles Unicode, it's just how you enter it. Uh, you'd have to also set up keyboards. You'd have to define if you want to get your keyboard working. There's settings, it's in control panel, there's languages and regional settings. 
a um, little too long to explain here, but uh, here just to to quickly show. Can you also just do alt and send uh, numeric keypad sequences to do it? It's a pain, but... It's, I haven't really done it for Unicode. I used to do it a lot for extended ASCII. Yeah, there's a way of doing it for Unicode also. It just... I don't know enough of the numbers to be able yeah. to do anything with it's, it. It's, oh, by the way, what I brought up is a Russian desktop. And um, one of the things that's very interesting in Windows of recent vintage is when you have it set for another language and you bring up Windows Explorer, your sections like my music, my downloads, my documents will be in that language. The interesting thing is underneath, if you went into command line and did a directory, you know, went under user and went under the person's uh, ID, it's still in Latin alphabet. It's still, uh, but uh, to make it easier for the uh, people uh, using it, they sort of put a little translator. I'll show a, one more screen because this uh, this is a, both cool, but it can be dis, disorientating to people. Yeah, this is why I do it before people have too much to drink. No. Um, okay, this is an Arabic desktop. You know, not expecting you to read it, but what's the first thing you notice? Windows Media Center. Windows Media Center. Well, that's yeah, because it was uh, it's a halfway thing. It's, I didn't buy a hundred percent Arabic. It's with a language pack, but the start button, the menu comes up on the right hand side because it's a right to left language. And it does the same thing as the Russian, localize the labels. And uh, that's, uh, let me give you the contact. Oh, yeah. One more question. Sure. Anybody signing digital certificates with these? I would imagine that would have to be the case. Yeah, I think they would have to sign it with the PONY code. They would sign it for the PONY code. Uh, I'd, I'd have to see how they handle the Unicode label, but Ponycode would be the way to go. That was my question. I think that's interesting. Yeah, but uh, thank you for giving me another thing to look, uh, look up because that is quite fascinating because this is adjustment. We're going through uh, trying to make, uh, make it work for uh, people around the world. By the way, that was a truck I saw when I went to security besides slightly modified graphic, but it was actual company called Trojan Horse, which delivers on contract U.S. mail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, this was like, I couldn't believe it. And I'm driving up, you know, trying to take a picture, hoping no trooper is coming behind me. Yeah. There's my contact info. Um, uh, you definitely can find me on on Twitter, that's my main medium th these days, and uh, you know, can email me. And thank you, Marcus. I had one one more uh, comment. Uh, I was thinking that you know how I, I see a lot of people blocking like dynamic DNS and all that stuff. Man, if somebody just started running like a dynam dynamic DNS like that, and you just have some random Cyrillic or something, that'd be quite interesting to, to see how, well, I guess you could block the IP addresses or whatever, but, but that'd be kind of interesting attack vector, dynamic DNS, but in a different language. Yeah, I think it would be proxy filter, web proxy filters. All right, uh, it was a long day. I appreciate everybody for coming. Uh, what we're going to do is 9 o'clock is what I think we said, 9 o'clock, uh, so go have some need out in the community. Uh, I don't know where you're going to eat at. I, I got to take myself somewhere to eat. So 9 o'clock, make sure you get something in your belly first before you start drinking all this alcoholic beverages, you know? <laughs> Alright, so uh, thank you very much for coming. First day is over with. And uh, thanks.